see most of you. There's a hole in the roof. Jesus had been traveling around, teaching, healing, casting out demons. He finally had a chance to go back to his hometown, what seems to be his hometown, uh, Capernaum. Maybe he was hoping to get a little bit of rest. The scripture says a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. Now, we don't know if this was his actual home or not. Don't think so. Not even sure that it was his mother's home, even though that's one of the theories, because Jesus said at one point that he had no place to lay his head. He had no place to call home. Could have been Peter's home. Wherever it was, it was a place that he called home. Capernaum seemed to be his, his hometown. It was where his heart was, where he stayed whenever he, st he stayed there. The key point of it all is that people knew that he was back in town. And they came. They gathered around his house. And they gathered. And they gathered. It says they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left. Not even outside the door. Every spot inside the house was filled. A lot of the houses had a courtyard around them. That was all filled. Any place that you could hear him was filled. People were crowding around to see him, hear him teach, maybe even to get him to touch them and heal them. And he preached the word to them. He was not just a miracle worker. Maybe that's the idea that some of these people had. Is they were following. They wanted him to heal and cast out demons. and Maybe that's how they were looking at him. That's probably why most of them were there, was to be healed by this miracle work. But he began to teach them the word of God. He began to teach them about the kingdom of God. When he came down to earth, he came down to teach the kingdom of God. He said the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is near. It is among you. He taught them how he would fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies and teachings and all the rules that the priests had them follow. He taught them what it actually meant. And it became a little bit easier. Easier to live and easier to understand. So some of the problems is that whenever a person thinks that we can make God's word easier to understand, we usually make it a whole lot harder. Man in his wisdom thinks that he can improve on God's wisdom. An example, one of the problems we have in, in, over here in the States anyway is with wheat and gluten. I'm not picking on you that. <laughs> this is a big problem. Why is it a big problem? Didn't God create wheat? Didn't he call it good? In the biblical days, wheat was a perfect food. But man decided we can make it better. And now we've got all kinds of problems associated with it. Honey was also one of those. It was a perfect sweetener. But because of mankind's delving into the genetics of all these other plants and all stuff like this, even honey is no longer the good food that it was. Anytime man thinks that he can improve on one of God's creations, he destroys it. We have a tendency to do that with the Bible, with the teachings of the Bible. We try to make the Bible fit in what we understand instead of making us fit into the Bible. It causes all kinds of theological problems. One of the largest is that of evolution. Mankind has tried to make the Bible fit into what science thinks they know instead of making science fit into what God says. Get it backwards. You, you, if you can find an old science book, you know, one from 30, 40, 50 years ago, compare what it teaches as fact to what today they teach as fact. Man's science keeps changing. His truth keeps changing, but God's truth does not change. God's science has never changed. Because God works with principles. Principles are things that are true anywhere, everywhere, and they will not change. God is wisdom. So God's wisdom is so far above man's wisdom that you know, what we think we understand now and we know for sure 
a couple of years from now, it'll probably be different. Our wisdom is flawed. And what we think we know, we don't know. And continuing on in the story, so some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. At least four men were there besides this paralyzed man. So some men came, and then it says there were four that carried him. There could have been more. They brought their friend because they wanted him healed. Jesus, the miracle healer, the master healer, was in town. The problem was they didn't start out soon enough. By the time they got to the house, the crowds were already there. They couldn't get in. Maybe one of them could push their way through, but they could not carry this paralyzed man through the crowd. <clears throat> the only place was the empty roof. Now, you could possibly hear up there, but probably not, because that's why it was empty. If, I think if the people would have been able to hear, they would have been sitting up there also. Now, think of the roof in those days. Um, it was made to support weight. It was flat, usually. During the hot summer nights, the family would go up there and they would sleep on the roof. Uh, sometimes they would put their sheep up on the roof in order to protect them and keep them safe. So this was a good, solid roof. Not just, you know, some of the pictures you see, it's a, you know, some hay and stuff up there, and you just pull it back. This was a solid structure. And these four men were determined to make sure that their friend got to see Jesus. So they started tearing the roof apart. They tore a hole through. You can only imagine all that debris that was falling down on top of all the people that was down there. And since they lowered this man on the mat down in front of Jesus, that means Jesus was covered with all the stuff that fell off of this roof. They managed to drop him right down in front of Christ. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Sons, Son, your sins are forgiven. These five men knew that Jesus could heal, and they knew that he would heal. Remember the paralytic we looked at, I think it was last week? said to Jesus, if you are willing, you can heal me. Jesus said, I am willing. It seems as though Jesus was willing to heal anybody that was brought to him. His compassion was great. But this time, instead of touching the person and healing them, he says something strange. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. Why would he say that? I think it's because Jesus, as God, knows that man is sick. Mankind is sick. Is spiritually sick. And that's what needs to be healed first. We need to be healed of the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus is always more concerned about our spiritual life than our physical life. Not that he's not concerned about it. He will help take care of us. He will heal. I mean, he's healing every people then. He's concerned about our physical being, but he was more concerned about this man's spiritual being. Maybe his paralysis was the result of a sin. Many times it's not. Most of the time our sickness is just a sickness. It's a virus. Now there is, you can blame all sickness on sin. You can do that. When God created the Garden of Eden, it was perfect. There was no sickness until sin entered. So, yes, sickness is the result of all sin. But I'm talking about the sickness of an individual. Sometimes a sin will cause a sickness. Even David talked about that. And he prayed to God in some of his psalms. The, the turmoil that causes sickness in his body. But a lot of times, the sickness is just a sickness. Sometimes a cold is just a cold. Now they were sitting there listening to Jesus, some, some teachers, the religious leaders. Seems like they were there just to catch him on something. This is the beginning of opposition to his teaching. They were there to correct him, to point out his false theology. So a lot of times, no matter how good a person is, no matter how good their works are, Jesus, God in the flesh, who went around healing and casting out demons, they were after him. 
They wanted to put him down. He had opposition. They were always trying to find fault with him. Now these leaders, these religious leaders were sitting there and they heard Jesus say, Son, your sins are forgiven. And the scripture says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this man, talk, this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God? Scripture teaches that God has the power to forgive sins. God, the Father, has the power to forgive sins, to save a person from eternal hell. And yet here is this man claiming to be Messiah, forgiving sins. To take what is God's and claim it for yourself is blasphemy. That was one of the main charges for his crucifixion. It was blasphemy. They accused Jesus of trying to take God's honor, insulting God by claiming to be God. The problem was that they, they were right. Only God can forgive sins. And that's exactly what he was doing. Their problem was they didn't understand that he was God. They didn't want to accept that he was God. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. So he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. See, another attribute of God that Jesus claims as his own was knowing the thoughts of, of man, knowing a person's thoughts. See, even Satan does not know your thoughts. He is a good deducer. And my computer said that's not a word, but it is on my paper. He can watch you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows if he does this, you'll probably do this. But he does not know your thoughts. Only God knows the thoughts of man. Now Jesus was going to teach these teachers of spiritual matters and spiritual truth. He's going to teach them that he is Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. He is Emmanuel, God with us. That he is God himself. Now the title Son of Man was one that Jesus took on himself. It's one that he used constantly because he wanted to let people know that he was totally identifying with humans. That he was a human being. Colossians 2, chapter 2, verse 9. I've got some different translations here. All the same verse. The first one is from Young's literal translation. It says, because in him doth tabernacle all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The NIV says, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. The English Standard Version says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. New Living Translation, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. And then they had this other translation as an alternative. In him dwells all the completeness of the Godhead bodily. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus was God. Every bit of God wrapped up in a human body. Not just filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just a human being that the Holy, the Holy Spirit had dwelled, but He was God in the flesh. Therefore, He wanted to teach these teachers of the law who He was. So He says, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I have the authority to forgive sins, therefore I am God. I want you to know without a shadow of a doubt that I, Jesus, Yeshua, Messiah, I am Emmanuel. I am God with us. I am, I am. And he used that name of God consistently throughout the New Testament. So what happens? Turns to the man, says, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Using different words to do the exact, the exact same thing. This man was healed, not just physically, but he was healed spiritually. He got up, 
took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Remember last week we talked about when he was teaching, the people said, we've never heard anybody teach like this with such authority. And here he is again. We've never seen anything like this. Who is this man? Even though they wanted to accept him as Messiah, their problem was they misunderstood who Messiah was. Well, their problem was expecting Messiah to do something that he didn't come to do at that time. He's coming back to do that later. At this time, he was setting up a spiritual kingdom. They didn't understand that. Now, this man hears what Jesus says, and he obeys immediately. It doesn't say that he sat there arguing with Jesus, you know, I've been paralyzed for too long and all this stuff. Jesus says, get up, take your bed and go home. The man got up, took his bed and left. We have no idea how long he was paralyzed. It could have been from birth, it could have been an accident. How he got paralyzed is not the key, it's not the point. The fact is that he was paralyzed, he could not walk, yet he got up and walked out. When Jesus spoke, he obeyed. How many of you remember the E.F. Hutton commercials on TV? When E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody shut up to listen. When Jesus speaks, we should do the same thing. We need to shut up. We need to shut our mouths and listen to what he's saying instead of trying to justify ourselves, trying to figure out and reason what, why he's telling us to do those things. We need to just obey. This man believed Jesus was Messiah and proved that belief through his faith. So again, remember, belief and faith are different. Quite often we use them together, but they're not. They're closely related. You can believe something but not have faith in it. This man believed that Jesus was, was Messiah. He activated his faith when he stood up. Faith always calls for action. And until your head knowledge turns into heart action, your head knowledge does you absolutely no good. You can have the entire Bible memorized and still go to hell. You must live out what you know. That is faith. And this man's action, this man's faith, affected everybody around. His friends that brought him in, everybody that was watching, and I think even those teachers of the law. It says, this amazed everyone. They were part of that everyone. So what in your life from God amazes you? Is there anything that happens that causes you amazement? Does God amaze you? If not, why not? God is God. The creator of all that exists we are a creation of His. What about Him amazes you? Or have you gotten to the point where you've developed, I'm going to say, I don't want to say relationship, because if it's a true relationship, you would understand what that means. <laughs> he is God. We need to follow our face in front of Him. We develop this buddy, this friendship. He, he's my buddy. He's with me all the time. We forget who he is. He hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same God who created the earth. We can be amazed at that. We need to look at our lives and look at the things that he does and allow him to amaze us. Because when he does that, we then put him in his proper Take a few moments to think about that. What about God amazes you?